the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Kremlin Games, Papal Steaks, Captain Nemo, Little Nemo, and Good Night Noises Everywhere. Plus, when oil paints get whimsical, the spattering. And part eight of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. We have an interview with legendary cover artist Tom Kidd this time. Tom has done over 200 Bain covers. He's the artist on many of the 1632 Ring of Fire novels, including all of the recent covers, such as 1636 Kremlin Games, 1636 The Devil's Opera, 1635 Papal Stakes, and the latest entry is 1636 Commander Cantrell in the West Indies. Out in June, hardcover booksellers everywhere, and that one's by Eric Flint and Charles E. Gannon. And in addition to our interview with Tom Kidd, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic as read by Bronson Pinchot. But first, here's the news. The May E-Arcs are out. An E-Arc is the path of least resistance when a malfunctioning falling elevator encounters and passes through a giant cube of lime jello on its way to the bottom of the shaft. Or not. Actually, these are electronic advanced reading copies, which are the first pass typeset, but not proofread early editions of e-books. We sell them at BainEbooks.com and at the Bain eBooks mobile site and via the Bain app for those who want to get their favorite authors and series a couple of months early, sometimes even more in certain cases. Out right now is Islands of Rage and Hope by John Ringo. This is part three of the Black Tide Rising series about the sailing armada of surviving humans on a post-apocalyptic zombie-plagued earth as they fight back. Also out is Wen Spencer's Wood Sprites, book four in her Elf Home series. In this entry, twin geniuses Louise and Jillian Mayer have to use science and magic to save their baby brother and sisters when war breaks out in Elf Home. Finally, Charles E. Gannon's Trial by Fire is also out as an e arc. This is Chuck Gannon's sequel to his Nebula nominated Fire with Fire. So, if you can't wait and want to read them early and often, these are available at BainEbooks.com at the Bain mobile site, which is BainEbooks.com forward slash mobile, M-O-B-I-L-E, and by using the Bain app, which is now available for all Android devices. I want to welcome Tom Kidd to the podcast. Hi, Tom. Tom Kidd is an Ur cover illustrator at Bain Books. He's done dozens of Bain covers. He's probably best known of late by the Bain audience as the illustrator for almost all of the covers for Eric Flint's Ring of Fire series, alternate history novels and collections. Tom is the winner of seven Chesley Awards. He's the winner of the World Fantasy Award for an Artist and is a multiple Hugo finalist. In addition to book covers for many publishers, Tom does conceptual design for film, theme park, and figurines for companies such as Walt Disney. He's also the author of an artist autobiography, Kidography, as well as several instructional books on illustration with some wonderful titles, Other Worlds, How to Imagine, Paint, and Create Epic Scenes of Fantasy, and How to Draw and Paint Dragons, a complete course built around these legendary beasts. Those are two books. Um, and they're great books. I, uh, I had a look at Other Worlds last night. It's a wonderful, uh, it has some great art philosophy as well as instruction in it. So, Tom, what is it with you and dirigibles? Oh, well, first, uh, uh, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate that. Um, dirigibles for me, airships, um, I, I, <laughs> I was using them as, as a, a vehicle in a story that I'd been writing for years. Um, but also, they're an underutilized technology. I, I think there was a, a period in history where uh, the success of the airship went a 
awry. It, it, actually, it had several hits where things just weren't working out for it. And the nail in that coffin, of course, would be uh, the announcement of the crashing of the Hindenburg. Uh, two-thirds of the people survived that crash. And that, was, that of course, was filled with hydrogen, uh, right. uh, very flammable gas. And that announcement pretty much ruined airships <laughs> as far as people's perception of them. But the, in that, they are very useful and that they should be used for transport and, and vacations and everything else. It's a shame that, that they're not being used. So I created a world in which they pretty much had to have been used. And that world is uh, it, the main character in that world is a character named Nemo, uh, who is an artist. So that's how those airships came about. And and after doing tons and tons of research search on them and redesigning them myself, whenever an opportunity to work one into a book cover and illustration comes up, I'm very happy to do that. And since people see these airships in my paintings, often they assign me uh, that work as well. We've seen some great ones on the uh, on the recent Ring of Fire series entries. Yes, yes. Uh, Eric, the, the the main author in all of those books, Eric Flint, sure. is reticent to have too many, <laughs> but, but he's allowed me a, he's allowed me a few, and. Um, They've been, I think, pretty successful covers, at least in that I hear from people telling me how much they like them. That and my more humorous covers. They like those, too. Yeah. But, uh, I would say my all-time favorite kid cover on a Ring of Fire book is the uh, 1636 Kremlin Games, where you have the guys uh, around, a, I, is it a Dodge? It's like uh, the Dukes of Hazard car, I believe. Yes, it is. It is. And, and uh, they're... They're having a shootout. It, it, it with, a, with a lot of those covers, I have some conversation with the authors, and we kind of work them out so that everything. It, 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 this world that Eric Flint has invented is so big and so complicated. Um, it's quite difficult to make sure you're staying within the, the sphere of what's what is possible in that fiction. So if I have a question, um, I put that question to Eric, and then Eric puts it to yet another author and another author, and then finally I, I, I get an answer, and um, that way we avoid problems with the illustration yeah. matching that, that new history that's been written. Yeah. Well, we've talked to Eric numerous times on the podcast, and it's just amazing that that sort of group mind of, uh, of 1632 – dot org folks that he's able to call on he's created something that i don't think i've ever seen in this collective uh this collective universe that has the people so engaged the, the reason i believe that in fact tony my boss tony weiskopf publisher at bain has told me the reason that we love tom kid covers is because you're able to give it that that feel of um of the time period which is 1632 but of course it's time traveling town that went back in time and you sneak in that humorous or, or odd uh, future element that suddenly uh, the viewer sees that's, that's thinking about buying the book that, that so intrigues them. I like to look for um, a subtle anachronism that I can fit into the 17th century. And sometimes it's barely there in the story, but I'll find it. I can do a straight illustration, but there'll be that one piece that uh, an observant uh, reader can catch and know that this is not um, this is not a, a true history. Mm -hmm. Something is awry. Well, one quality that everyone notices about uh, most of your covers is that they are originally oil paintings, or they seem to be. Uh, there's a lushness and expressiveness that uh, to them that you know some of the computer generated covers. I mean, some of our artists are quite good at those, and they do beautiful, uh, evocative work, but, but sometimes they miss out on the old feel of, of the painting. Are all, all your paintings on canvas? 
Well, they're, they're, they're all oil paintings. All the, all the covers I've done for Bain, with maybe a couple of exceptions, are oil paintings. Um, uh, a smaller portion are on canvas. Mostly it's on um, a gessoed uh, surface. So it's a, it's a flat surface that I'm working on. Why do, you, why do you like this medium so much? Well, I, I have been at this a long time. Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been working as an illustrator since 1980. And I mean, successfully as an illustrator since 1980. Unsuccessfully a few years before that. Um, I like the idea that when I'm done painting, I have an original something that can be framed, something that can hang in a museum, a gallery. I, I don't like the idea of something being so flimsy as, as a, a digital piece, although the, the same skill, the same imagination, the same amount of work goes into those paintings. You just don't end up with a physical object. You can, you can do a print. You can make a print of it but you can make dozens of prints. And uh, my experience uh, as a young artist was seeing work in print. And I saw many paintings in print and thought to myself, those are beautiful paintings. One day, I think I'll go and see some of the originals. And I had an opportunity, finally, to go to a museum and see some of my favorite paintings at the Delaware Art Museum. And the difference between the original and the printed piece was astounding. There's no comparison to an original painting. Uh, it's, it's like a punch in the stomach when you see some of the original paintings done by uh, N.C. Wyeth, Howard Byron, Hornwell, the list goes on, uh, uh, Frazetta, Jeff Jones, um, all of those artists. It's, it's just so much better to see the original. So that's why I paint in, in oil. I'm I, I kind of have um, a dual studio. It's, it's, it's as digital as it can be, as well as traditional as it can be. Uh, I, I, I have a high ceiling so I can paint giant paintings. <laughs> and then I have scanners, cameras. Um, I have a tablet uh, for working on my color sketches, which I don't feel the need to do them in... Um, a physical object. I don't need a physical. I, I typically do them digitally, and it allows for a lot of adjustments. So I can figure out exactly how the painting is going to look. Well, not exactly. Somewhat how the painting is going to look when when completed. Especially when I'm not sure. It's a good way to go to test it on the computer first. But I I I double my expenditures. I double. I, I spend more money keeping both than going straight digital, but I decided that that's the way it's going to stay. And on top of that, people tell me, Tom, please don't go digital. <laughs> so I feel I, sh I it, it, since I feel I should stay, uh, continue doing the, do it the way I'm doing it, and other people tell me, or insist, they're insistent that I, I not be a digital painter. I've decided that I'll just stay that way. Well, is there's a wonderful a couple of photos of your studio uh, at in the book Other Worlds, or um, I'm sorry, yes, Other Worlds. Your uh, one of your instructional uh, books on how to fa paint fantasy and landscapes and such. Um, is that still your studio? Is that the way it looks? No, I built a new one. Oh, you did. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I built a new one. Uh, it's it's. Um... It's much more spacious. Um, it has better light. Speaking of your younger days and going to museums, can you tell us a little bit about your development? How did you, how did you get started? Did you know from a young age that you wanted to be an artist? Yes, I did. I decided that art was for me at age twelve. I I had actually I had actually thought that was the direction I was going to go in much younger than that. People always told me that I was very good at drawing, and I just wasn't sure. It didn't seem like a practical way to live. I was I was a practically minded kid, and um, I ran across the work of some 
illustrators, Norman Rockwell in particular, and that looked like something I would like to do. Uh, the, the paintings that I saw that were famous painters of the time, people in the museums, that wasn't what I wanted to do. That didn't appeal to me at all. It was a work of illustrators that appealed to me. So I knew that's, that's what I wanted to do. And I know you're, you're going to ask me whether I was reading science fiction at that time, and I was. <laughs> yeah. I started reading science fiction at a, at a young age, but it never occurred to me that, that there, there could be a, a field in which I could be enjoying reading the fiction I love and doing the kind of paintings I love. I thought that an illustrator would be a straight illustrator who did all manner of things. But um, uh, at first, actually, I even thought that I would be a commercial artist because that seemed like also another practical job. But I read an entire book on how to be a commercial artist, and it didn't look like a lot of fun to me. So I decided against it, even though I guess you could call an illustrator a commercial artist. But when I ran across um, uh, a certain number of illustrators' work, and I saw more uh, science fiction book covers, adult books, other than the, the children's books I was reading as a kid, I realized that, that perhaps I could do book covers. And I started uh, gearing myself in that direction. I had a very nice um, art teacher in high school, and this is years going on. I'm still, from age 13 on, I'm planning on being an illustrator and working towards that goal. So in high school, I had a very nice art teacher, and um, she encouraged me in, in this pursuit. Uh, she took my work, and um, it's about age 17, I think, and put it into the Florida State Fair. I was living in Florida at the time. And I won the, the top scholarship to go to Syracuse University. I have uh, this was even the, the this was laminated and sent to me um, a uh, short interview with me about how I won this scholarship. And in this interview, it says, uh, when Tom graduates from college, he wants to move to New York and do science fiction uh, book covers and magazine illustration. <laughs> oh, talk and, about being uh, prescient. I like that because that, it, it's one of the rare occasions I did exactly what I said I would do. One, one story that I like that I've, I've read in interviews with you is your first encounter with, uh, with a real live right before you Chesley uh, Bonstall painting. Well, I think it's one of the moons of Saturn. Um, the, the, your description of, of realizing where the artist was standing yeah, the, the the idea, Ches, Chesley Bonestell, we, we this 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 is why um, I think I had a natural attraction to science fiction. We had uh, a set of encyclopedias uh, that that my parents had bought when my brother was born, my older brother, only a year older than me, and I looked up astronomy in there. I don't know for what reason, but I looked it up. And I saw the two paintings in there that were by Chesley Bonestell. And, and the one you mentioned, and there was another one, um, a lunar landscape, I think. And I thought to myself, this artist, I, I knew that it was done by an artist. I didn't, I didn't think it was a photograph. It had imagined something that I, I didn't think I could have ever imagined myself. That he had he had imagined this place, taken someone to it, and and shown it to us. Uh, it, that was the most astounding illustration I had seen to date. And I thought that's something that's something really cool that I would like to do. Even though even though I I've done maybe a dozen astronomical total in my life, um, th the basic idea that. You could imagine something in such a real manner uh, greatly appealed to me. Something amazing as well. And when I often, when I'm working as an illustrator, especially on the 1632 series, you're not seeing on that cover illustration 
that that I've done schematics of how some of the uh, um, machinery, the new machinery <laughs> works. How I've worked out how how these things, uh, uh, how they've rebuilt uh, uh, in this time period uh, as best they can using some uptime technology, uh, and and I find that a, a great joy is to is to build the put all the mechanisms in there, see them, but not necessarily are you is, is the viewer going to see them. They're, it's going to be hidden. But I've thought it all through. I've imagined it. Um, and um, a more recent cover I did, um, uh, the Viennese Waltz. That's, uh, that's coming out in the fall, 1636, the Viennese Waltz. It'll be an October hardcover, I believe. <laughs> For me, the fun part is uh, cars, automobiles going through Vienna, um, and the thought suddenly occurred to me that this would be the first time dogs are chasing cars. <laughs> so, so I made sure to include uh, dogs in there. And I know it's a little bit of an aside, but that's that's kind of the fun of the series to me. is is a little It's a little teeny idea that I can kind of insert into the story. Not mentioned in the text but you know car a dogs chase everything that goes by yeah it would totally be there age co yeah yeah oh you know i i uh this give an idea is that i re i try my best to research these books and i thought to myself i wonder if, if they would have kept dogs out of the city somehow it seems impossible that they could but i found some um old uh illustrations from that period, actually from that period, and I noticed there were dogs in there. So I said, well, no worries then. The other interesting thing, thing about um, um, Chesley Bonestell is that the, there was an association of science fiction artists who wanted to come up with an award that they would give out each year. This is how far back I go. This is before such an award existed. And uh, the people who were organizing it uh, were trying to figure out how to set it up where it would be given out, so forth and so on. And I sent them a letter, and I suggested to them that, much like the Hugo, they named this, since, since Chesley Bonasso had an early effect on me, that they named the award the Chesley. And that's how, that I, that's how it got its name. I, I came up with that. <laughs> cool. But it's a logical idea. I'm sure other people would have thought of it as well. Yeah. And then you went on to point. win a number of them. As well. Yeah, yeah. The um, that so was, that was also satisfying. I'll bet. So, so tell us about the early days. So you left Syracuse, you went to New York, and you met met a guy named Jim Bain. How did uh, how did that develop? I wasn't sure what to do after leaving college. I I dropped out. It seemed way too expensive, <laughs> even with the scholarship and everything. Uh, it seemed way too expensive to me. I thought I should hurry up and get my career started. So I moved to. Uh, uh, to New York with really not much of a plan other than to try to find work. And I ended up working for uh, a few publishers, Ace Books, Berkeley Books. Um, I even did an illustration for Starlog Magazine. I worked for <laughs> I worked for a magazine called Beyond Reality Magazine, which was, uh, uh, they covered UFOs. And um, I... I was told that there's a couple of people told me. Um, my girlfriend at the time said, "Hey, Tom, uh, there's a new company starting up called Tor Books." And uh, a couple other neighbors, um, uh, I think Stu Schiffman, another guy named Ira Donowitz, said, "Tom, you should go over there." And I said, "Well, let me set up an appointment." So I immediately called and I went over to Tor Books. I think they had been around for three weeks, uh, and I showed. Jim, my portfolio, and I had been doing sample paintings to, to show to publishers on a regular basis. Jim looked at two of them. I brought in originals <laughs> because I didn't have copies of them. I brought them right in. Jim looked at them and said, that would make a nice cover for a book we have coming up. And it was actually a painting I had done uh, uh, after reading Starship Troopers. I... I was impressed with many of the ideas in there, especially with the idea of an armored suit and nuclear explosions going off. And he put it on a book called Earth Descended. Mm -hmm. 
And he bought another piece for me. I forget what that was now off the top of my head. And then he gave me an assignment. So and, and it, very quickly after one meeting, um, I had um, sold rights to two existing paintings, been hired to do a cover. And after that, I started working for uh, Tor Books on a regular basis. And then when Jim split off to start paying books, I was working for both companies. And I'm thinking I've, I've done, I don't know, close to 200 covers for, for Bain and maybe another 150 for Tor Books, something like that. I've done a lot. Um, and... Working with Jim was Jim was always uh, very good to me. He was always fair to me. He was of all the people I work with. Uh, he never did anything that I thought was uh, unprofessional. And I, I at one point, I went off to uh, work exclusively with a, uh, a company that ultimately went out of business. But I wasn't doing book covers. I was doing my own book. We mentioned uh, the airships and Nemo earlier. I was hired by them, and they wanted this book done as, as quickly as I could. And I told them it would take at least two years to do. And, and they want, so they wanted me to work exclusively for them for that time period. And uh, Jim told me he thought that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that I should continue doing covers for him. And I, I said, well, I really want to do this book of my own. And, um, well, before I finished the book, this company went out of business. And uh, I went back to Jim, and I said, Jim, I, 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 you were right. I should have continued working with you. He says, no problem. Here's some more covers to do. So, anyway. Well, I mean, he knew a good thing when he had it, <laughs> so probably. Well, I, I did too. I did too, and uh, um, they, and and uh, through Tony, I continue to work with uh, uh, Bang Books today, and uh, enjoy every minute of it. So, what are you've done? Two hundred covers, or or so, you for for Bain. Um What are some of your personal favorites that you've done? Can I know that um, it's really hard to answer such a question? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard, um, partly because of uh, um, my uh, terrible memory, uh, but but not so much for the covers I've done, but also because um, I work with Jim at Tor Books and I work with Jim at Bain Books. It's difficult sometimes for me to uh, separate them. So what I did earlier today. To, to, jog my memory. I looked up some of the older covers I did. But oh, among my among my um uh favorite favorite recent covers um have been um many of the sixteen thirty two covers. Uh the uh, Grantville six uh and um uh the, the among the earliest ones though is a book cover I did for Jim titled Unknown. And it was a collection of stories from the magazine Unknown. And I, um, so I titled the painting Unknown. <laughs> and that act actually got me into trouble. In at least three exhibits, people came to me and said, Tom, you can't, um, you can't, you, you need to come up with a real title for a painting. You can't just put the title as Unknown. <laughs> <laughs> I also did some covers for uh, Werner Vinge books with him. Right. Um, I marooned in real time, which he he uh, sort of co-art directed uh, with uh, Jim Frinkle, who did the hardback version, and and that's among my favorites as well. I have to go into the archives and pull that out to have a look at it. Uh, among the more fun covers I did uh, were was the Draxis series. It was a chance to do. Uh, something humorous. You're talking about the uh, the wizard who's a detective. British author Martin Scott. That's who it was. Well, I love those Thraxis books. Those were great, and your covers were great for them. Among the more fun covers I did too, I did I did uh, a bunch of Terry Pratchett books. Um, anyway, since we were talking humorous, that could be another. Uh, Stanley Schmidt. I don't know. 
Yeah. By the way, I couldn't think of Stanley Schmidt earlier, and he was the editor for Unknown. Ah, okay. The longtime analog editor as well. Yes. Yeah. Which I, I should know him. I, I don't know why I didn't think of it. I've worked for him, too. You mentioned the Nemo Project several times, um, and it's it's available, and what you've done on it is available and visible at your website. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The idea behind that is a profusely illustrated book, um, each page carefully crafted and designed and coordinated with a true science fiction story. And it's about, it's kind of a classic beginning. Uh, a kid is sent to another planet. Um, he doesn't know the language. He doesn't know where he is. He has only a vague idea of how he got there. And he sort of learns that culture because it, the there's no child services. There's nobody who's going to look after him there. Uh, there's no one who knows what to do with him. Here he is as somebody in a, in a world where he knows nothing. Uh, he's wandering around trying to figure out what he's going to do. And he is an artist. He passes through a park, and he sees somebody doing drawings for people, doing portraits. So he, he, he conveniently has with him uh, a sketch pad, and he sets himself up, and he starts pantomiming what he would like to do for people. And he does portraits for free at first until finally uh, people start coming to him, and he becomes known as uh, uh, Nemo the Mute Portrait Artist. Now, that's not the character's name. Uh, that's not his real name. That's just the name the people of that world give him. And then he begins to discover things. He begins to discover how, how the culture works. He begins to pick up on the language. Um, he um, uh, is one of the people who comes to sit for a portrait, tells him of the great adventures he has as a traveling naturalist. Where And, and he most fascinated by this, this idea of traveling to these exotic places and exploring these things. And... The fellow says, well, you know, I, I have need for uh, an assistant on on these travels, and and perhaps you'd like to join me. And it's it's much like um, um, 17th century sailing vessels. They, you know, hire uh, or recruit young men to, to be on the ship to be cabin boys and everything else. And so uh, uh, Nemo's told that he's going to be one of the ship's artists. He's going to document everything. But that's not the case. He's just being, he's just being taken advantage of, and he's going to become a cabin boy. But what he also doesn't realize at first is that, that this ship that he's traveling on is actually an airship. And the thought of airships being used by traveling naturalists to me seemed like a, a fantastic idea. And I had never heard of it before. And having read a fair amount of science fiction, and I, I thought I had an original idea. It has expanded into three books now. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so I think I... You have a trilogy. Uh, of course, it's science fiction and fantasy. You mentioned before N.C. Wyeth. Um, didn't he have a famous character named Nemo as well? Is there any relation there? There's actually a few connections there. Um, the captain of the Nautilus was Captain Nemo. And also, uh, Windsor McKay, uh, the, um, um, had a character named Nemo as well. Uh, both of those spelled just with, with N, and it is, um, Latin for no one. So, it comes up here and there. And, um, since I came up with the idea of my Nemo with a silent G, uh, there has been a couple other um, projects I've seen where people have also titled it that. Well, we should mention that um, this is not just a description of. There's some beautiful. Uh, there's there's beautiful art to accompany this. You can see some of it at um, at Tom's site. Tom, what is your site again? We should mention that. Spellcaster.com. 
And the way the way to get there is spell. Yeah, I think if you just do spellcaster dot com, that'll get you there. Yeah, and the Nemo Project uh, illustrations are on there, and they're just some of them are just wonderful. Especially um, the dirigibles are my favorites. Much of what's on that site is older work, but there are dozens of new paintings that aren't just aren't there yet, and I need to I need to um, um, add them. But I will eventually. Well, tell us. Let's go back to book covers. Um, tell us your process, if you have one. Of uh, I'm sure you do. Of of producing, a, say, a typical book cover, or perhaps, a, say, Noah's Boy, the the cover you did for Sarah Hoyt's novel that's coming up uh, this summer. How much you go about creating a typical cover? What I what I like to do is read the entire book if I can. Um, often these days, I, the books aren't completed. They're, they're, they're in the pipeline. They're almost done. And, um, sometimes I get partial manuscripts, but what works best for me is to sit down, read the entire book. And as I go through, make notes as to what I think is uh, particularly interesting, particularly, um, that that fits that book that that when someone sees that cover they have a good idea as to what that book is about um from from there it's it's the the my the hardest part from there is to try to combine everything in a way that is also intriguing that makes somebody go well what's what's going to happen next what why is that so in that cover? What there's a mystery there. I want that mystery resolved. So I have to pick up this book. I have to read this book. I have to know know why this is the case. Um, I when I'm working up ideas, it's typically in pencil, and I I I. I can sometimes have a scene in my head right away, and I'll draw that scene up and draw it from different angles. And, and other times I'll just draw the characters just to get started. I'll draw um, a small element if nothing is coming up. Uh, even after all my notes, I may not have quite what I want. So I'll draw a small element and imagine you know, what the characters are doing with it, around it, um, and when it, it, it's it, the the direct approach, typically is the wrong one. It's always an oblique approach, where where I sneak up on an idea, an unsuspecting idea, and then and then when when it looks right, I pounce on the idea, and then I can draw it up. I. Um, uh, you, this is an approach that you specifically recommend in other worlds, I remember. Start by drawing something inconspicuous and work outward, something like that. Yeah, it, I don't know why it works so well. Um, I think that when, if you've ever been in a situation where someone says, okay, come up with six ideas for me right now, that's the worst way to come up with six ideas. You want to kind of ease into those ideas. You want you want your you want uh, your mind to free associate. You want it to wander. You want it to come up with something that's uh, different. And that's one of the things you'll see uh, with most of my covers, and in particular um, uh, the 1632 series. Is every cover tends to be different, and that's because all the stories are different. I I, I I they're going to have a similar look in that uh, I'm painting them and the the uh, type and so forth is the same, uh, so they'll always be connected. But uh, I I like the idea of um, a variety of of approaches. Sometimes it's it centers on the characters. Sometimes it centers on the odd situations. And other times it situates on a a, a melding of uh, a downtown a downtown downtime and uptime technology, which that is a lot of fun doing that. Um, 
in fact, I, one of the things I, 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 I wish I could do more is um, uh, if the authors came to me and said, hey, uh, we don't exactly know how something's going to look. And then and, and I, could, I could show them how I think it would look at least. And then they could tell me no, <laughs> which is fine. I, 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 I like that back and forth, though, and, and I have that with that series. So um, the dreaded question, uh, perhaps not dreaded, perhaps is something that you that you like to uh, to deal with. Um, what advice do you have to young artists that are uh, that are trying to be uh, fantasy illustrators, uh, science fiction illustrators, and uh, cover artists? Right now, things are a lot different than they were when I started out. In that, I made a physical appearance in places. I showed my portfolio. I met with our art directors. I lived in New York for the first six years as working as an illustrator. And having that um, uh, personal contact is something that really isn't the case anymore. And I don't, uh, in many cases, I don't even meet the people or even talk to the people that I work with. So it's a whole new world in that regard. In terms of finding uh, work is something I, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I can address, but I will say that working on the, the quality of your work, constant, constantly practicing what you're doing, constantly looking for new ways to do things is going to be the key. And I think, I think that with science fiction and fantasy, studying how the physical aspects of the world work are of tremendous importance. And uh, understanding light, understanding um, color, and understanding how trees grow and rocks form, all of that is going to come in handy when you, when you, when you start doing uh, your first illustrations. So I think that's probably the greatest importance is, is building that um, – that, that body of solid work, I, I, I'm not sure um, there's a number of places. I think nowadays there's a LuxCon, which is a great place to exhibit, and there's also a Spectrum Show uh, in the middle of the country each year. And I know that that where, however you're getting your work out there, however you're getting it seen, uh, that it's going to attract people who are going to be interested in, in working with you. So it, it, it's, it's a system that has worked for me, at least, is to come up with, um, try, try to do my best paintings, try to get them out there for people to see. And it's almost like you're, you're throwing out seeds and, and some are going to blossom into uh, great things and others, <laughs> others are going to rot in the soil. You just don't know. It's just the shotgun effect, mm -hmm. but with seeds, things that grow as opposed to kill. Well, so in other worlds, you say specifically learn to see the world as it is and not to, to, to get rid of perhaps preconceptions. And You know, you, 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 uh, I, uh, thank you for reading that book, by the way. Um, yeah, it's a great book. Uh, you bring up a good – thank you. you. You bring up a good point there, and um, it's also um, – uh, something that in the past three years I've taken up as a hobby. I I found that being in the studio hours, hour after hour after hour, um, turns out that's not a healthy thing. You need to get outside. You need to move around some. And um, I have a, a regular routine of walking. I, I walk all over, all over the area I live in. I walk out the back door, I cross the brook, I built a bridge so I can cross the brook, I walk into town, I walk along, there's a Housatonic River, and in doing that, I'm seeing things in this town that I did not know existed. I'm seeing a whole, it's, a, it's literally a whole new world. I've discovered, as much as Nemo has discovered his new world, I've discovered a new world just walking out my back door instead of driving. And and if I don't have 
perhaps I don't have time for it, but I have yet another idea of a far future world in which the characters uh, hover car. Everybody travels by hover car in this world. But, you know, we, we, it's it's you know like George Jetson, <laughs> and and uh, there are no roads anymore. Uh, much of the population of the world has actually left, uh, but there are a few sort of uh, caretaker types left behind, and um, and they live such a linear life that it's work, home, everything. You know, they can be virtually anywhere they want to be, um, uh, as well as virtually there, and so they never see what the world is is like out around their homes. And this one guy, for whatever reason, some freakish thing takes place, and his hover car doesn't work anymore. And and he um, he now finds that uh, he's trying to to get to work. He has no idea how to get to work, and he's he's consulting with with his home computer, talking to it, and and uh, she suggests, you know, look at this. It turns out you're only a mile and a half from where you work. You could walk there, according to this. <laughs> and he had no idea. So, so he just, in desperation, he decides he's just going to go ahead and walk to work. And he discovers that the world isn't quite what he thought it was. And, and that's the whole story. It, it, it's just, again, it's another illustrated story. Um, and it's based on my real life experience of walking around the town I live in. Because it, on top of that, uh, uh, two years ago, I became interested in taking pictures of birds. Uh, ultimately, a few months ago, uh, I bought uh, a 500 millimeter lens for my Canon camera, which brings in things super close now. And I see these tiny little birds. I see their activities. And now it's almost looking into this this strange elfin world that... I had no idea quite existed. I knew there were birds there. I didn't know what they were up to. And um, now I observe the tiniest little markings on them, little red marks on their heads, little yellow specks on their tails, um, the almost prismatic color of uh, morning doves. And all of that is working its way back into my work. Either, either it's either going to be the story that I, I told you about, or it's it's going to be um, uh, the, the next cover I do. An aspect of what I've learned is is now going to make it into my new new illustrations. It's not it's not like it's not like um, I see birds and I'm going to paint birds. I'm learning something from observing them that uh, perhaps I didn't know before, and that now works its way into it could be. Um, a demon. It could be um, uh, the the form an alien takes, um, or even if I'm doing, say, other animals. Now I understand quite how um, their claws work, say, and all of that. All of that kind of builds up. And so it's just, so. So no matter where I go, no matter what 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 I'm doing, I'm, I uh, I have this natural tendency to think, boy, this is this this would work really well as an illustration. <laughs> uh, so so my hobby ends up becoming a little bit of a job in a way, but a pleasurable one. Mm -hmm. Well, observer of worlds and creator of worlds, Bane cover artist Tom Kidd's work can be seen on hundreds, hundreds of Bane covers, and he's the definitive artist on the Eric Flint's Ring of Fire series books, uh, including latest entry, 1636 Commander Cantrell in the West Indies, which is by Eric and Charles E. Gannon. And also, uh, Sarah Hoyt's Shifter series uh, have kid covers, including Noah's Boy, which is coming out uh, in mass market paperback uh, in a couple of months, as well as the collection Night Shifters. I think it has a kid cover on it as well. Tom's books uh, include Biography Kidography, illustration instruction books of other worlds and dragons which i highly recommend and uh tom just thank you so much for being with us today thank you it was a pleasure and now here is part eight of the complete audiobook serialization of larry Correa's hard magic is read by bronson pincho this portion of hard magic is provided by audible.com get the complete audiobook at audible.com now 
If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's what has gone before. It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that has been magically changed. A handful of people from all walks of life have been visited with special magical talents. These people are called actives. Most actives use their powers for good, but some do not. One man who can confront power that's been twisted to the wrong side of good and evil is Jake Sullivan. Jake's a former soldier, an ex-con, an active heavy, and a private investigator in a dark and dangerous world. After being recruited into J. Edgar Hoover's Bureau of Investigation, and lately being thrown out of a dirigible for his trouble, Jake has now been approached by a secret organization of actives, led by one Blackjack Pershing. Its mission? Confront a powerful evil that's entered the world and is attempting to gain a stronghold. This is a threat that shows up in many places, even in the hard scrabble farms of rural California. Here is Bronson Pincho with part eight of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. El Nido, California. The day was like any other summer day in El Nido. Work, work, work. Try to get the hard stuff done before it got too hot so you could take a nap when it was really miserable and then back to work for the evening chores. Always up way before dawn to milk and feed. Only to dairy farmers did waking up to the cock's crow at sunrise feel like sleeping in. It had been a long time since the old farmer had slept in. He figured he could sleep when he was dead. The morning's work was done. Gilbert and most of the family had gone into town. That left just him and Faye to finish moving hay, but he didn't mind. The girl worked harder than most boys her age. Better company, too. Usually. So, I been thinking some more, Faye said as she threw a pile of alfalfa into the feeder. She paused to lean on her pitchfork, wiping the sweat from her face. Uh-oh, he replied, rolling his eyes. Is magic alive? He kept forking the hay over. He thought about it for a long time. Is electricity alive? Is fire alive? Hmm. Faye frowned. That's what I thought. That's bad, then. Why is that bad? The girl's brain was always spinning around about something. Because if magic ain't alive, and it's just stuck to some people, then why couldn't it be stuck to some thing? He froze pitchforks stuck in the hay. She didn't seem to notice. Why couldn't somebody figure out how to take someone else's magic and put it in like another person or an animal or a machine even? Stop it, the old farmer ordered sternly. Faye was confused. Stop what? Just... How could he explain? He didn't want to expose this poor girl to what was out there waiting but she was just too damn smart for her own good. Just never mind. Don't think about stuff too hard. Keep working. She sniffed. Are you mad at me, Grandpa? I could never be mad at you, girl. He kept working, letting the rhythm of the movement calm his thoughts. After a few seconds, Faye went back to her fork. Some day he would explain everything he knew to her, but he wasn't a man who liked to talk, especially about things like that. A few minutes later, the girl looked up. Somebody's coming, Faye said, pointing at the road. Sure enough, he could see the dust of approaching automobiles. Probably more thieving okies passing through. I'll lock the tool shed. He nodded. He had taught her well. But these autos weren't coming from the main road. They were coming from the direction of Potter Field, the little airfield a few miles away. They'd seen a metal single-wing cargo plane fly that way earlier. The whole family had stopped whatever they were doing to watch. It was quite the sight. There were just a few fabric biplanes at Potter. It wasn't like they got any fancy planes out in the San Joaquin Valley. 
The old farmer suddenly had a bad feeling. Throw the cows over the fence some hay, he told her, watching the approaching dust suspiciously. Do the dry cows first. Go. Faye hesitated, then did as she was told. He wanted her away. The rest of the family had taken the Dodge into Merced and wouldn't be back until it was time to start the 4 p.m. milking. There was nothing else along this road except for his dairy. The cars pulled up the lane and stopped in front of the house in a cloud of white dust. He went out to meet them. He didn't bother to hose off his boots. There were four men in each car, and all eight of them stepped out at the same time. Their clothes were fancy boy city clothes black or pinstriped suits and nice hats. The farmer didn't even dress that nice to go to church. He could tell these men might have been from the city, but they weren't fancies. They looked hard and dangerous. The old farmer knew right away why these men were here. His wide straw hat covered his gray eyes, and he risked a glance back toward the barn. Faye had done as she'd been told and was out of sight. The tallest one seemed to be the boss. He was square and thick, one of the biggest men the farmer had ever seen, with a jagged scar crossing half his face that had left one eye a blinded white orb. Are you Joe? That one asked. That didn't mean much. Half the Portuguese men in the world were named Joe. Traveling Joe? They had been bound to catch up with him eventually. The old farmer tipped his hat. Fay was sweating using a pitchfork to toss alfalfa over the barbed wire fence to the dry cows. The hay was dusty, collected in her hair and inside her too large hand-me-down work shirt, and it made her nose itch. She stopped to sneeze a couple of times, then went back to work. It was hot. The valley was always extra muggy in the summer, probably from the irrigation, and the sun was always beating down on her head. Her rubber boots were heavy with dried poop too big and made her feet sweat. And she was as happy as she could be. The Vieiras were good people. They were always loud, frantic, and yelling about something, but that's just how they were. At least here she didn't get beaten daily for having the devil in her. Grandpa was actually proud that she was different. And unlike her life before, there was always food. Faye liked to work. She didn't even mind the Holsteins much. Life was simple, and it was hard, but she was content because it wasn't mean. A cow stuck its head through the fence, curious, smelling her. It chuffed and blew green snot all over her pants. She wiped it off with a handful of hay and patted the cow on the nose. She licked Faye with a giant rough tongue, and the girl giggled. A gun fired. The line of Holsteins jerked, ears all cocked suspiciously in the same direction. It had come from the other side of the milk barn. A flock of black birds leapt into the air and flew over the roof. Grandpa was probably shooting at crows, but Faye frowned, since that sure hadn't sounded like Grandpa's shotgun. One of the dogs started barking like crazy. Then there was a whole bunch of guns. A giant mad bumblebee passed overhead, and it took Faye a second to realize that it was actually a bullet. Something was terribly wrong. She clutched the pitchfork tight, and the dry cows bolted from the fence and ran for the far side of the corral. The Okies are robbing Grandpa. It was like the bank robbers they talked about on the radio. Still holding the pitchfork, she ran for the barn, big boots clomping, but that was too slow, so she focused on a spot fifty feet ahead, which was as far as she'd ever traveled before. Touched the magic, sent her senses ahead, clear, and was just there. She'd done just like Grandpa had taught, appearing an inch or so off the dirt so she wouldn't melt her soles to the ground and hit the ground still clomping forward. Now she could see around the block edge of the barn and there were two black automobiles and a bunch of men in suits running toward the house and shouting. There was another boom and one of the men fell off the porch and into Grandma's rose bushes. A hand landed on her shoulder and Faye nearly jumped out of her skin. Girl! Grandpa whispered in her ear. He had traveled right behind her. He dragged her back around the corner as he broke open his shotgun, pulled the spent shell out, and fished another one out of his coveralls. He didn't seem any more upset than when he was dealing with a particularly nasty cow. 
Go hide. He snapped the shotgun closed and pointed with it toward the haystacks, but then he scowled. Sheet, forgot. Where are you going? Something in the barn I need. Go hide. He closed his gray eyes and disappeared. Fay focused on the haystacks. A man's voice came from behind her. There's somebody out, and then her boots landed in a pile of straw, and she didn't hear the rest. Scared, she scrambled behind some broken bales, just her eyes sticking over the top, and she searched for the men. The nearest one was rounding the barn, silver gun in his hand, and he was jerking his head back and forth, wondering where she'd gone. She squeezed the pitchfork even harder, though she didn't know what she planned on doing with it. Then she saw something strange. Another man, a giant, seemed to fly over the edge of the barn and landed easily on the tin roof. It was like he'd jumped right out of the yard, but Faye knew there was nothing to stand on over there, so he would have had to have leapt twenty-five feet straight into the air. The man crouched, scanning, slowly, perched effortlessly next to the lightning rod. He reached into his chute and pulled out a huge gun. Faye ducked lower so he couldn't see her. This man was special, too. Like her, but different. Scary. Grandpa traveled and appeared right behind the first man stabbing the shotgun barrel into him. The man never knew what happened as the Sears and Roebuck shotgun blew him near in half. But Grandpa didn't see the big man on the roof. Grandpa! Faye screamed. The old farmer looked up, seeing her, surely focusing on the safety of the haystack, and boom. Grandpa lurched forward as the man on the roof shot him. He traveled and was instantly before Fay. Grandpa took two steps and fell to his knees. Oh. Fay dropped the pitchfork, grabbed him by the straps of his coveralls, and dragged the little man behind the broken bales. Grandpa, she screamed. Blood was welling out from between the top buttons of his shirt, way too much blood. Hold on, Grandpa. He grabbed her wrist, his fingers hard as rocks, and he shoved an old leather bag into her hand and squeezed it shut. Blood came out his mouth when he tried to talk, and she had to put her ear down next to his mouth to hear him. Don't let them get it. Find black and then she couldn't hear the rest because it turned into a gurgle as he breathed out. He didn't inhale. Faye pulled away, and Grandpa Vieira's gray eyes were staring at nothing. Grandpa! A man in a suit came running around the edge of the hay. Faye saw him coming, and she was filled with an emotion she'd never felt before. The wood of the pitchfork was hard in her calloused hands as she rose, straw-colored hair covering her face. Fifteen feet away, the man raised his gun. He shouted to the others, I got the... But then Faye traveled, screaming, and drove the three narrow tines of the pitchfork through his ribs. Still screaming, she pushed the man, driving him back until his knees buckled and she drove the fork all the way through him and into the ground. The man grabbed onto the handle, but Fay put all her weight on the shaft and held him there while he kicked and cussed. After a few seconds, he quit moving. Hey, girl, a very deep voice said. She turned, and the giant man from the roof, the man that had killed the first person who'd ever loved her, the man who'd murdered her grandpa, was standing there, calm as could be, with the biggest revolver she'd ever seen pointed at her head. He cocked the hammer. One of his eyes was white. No reason for any more killing today, he lied. I'm looking for something, that's all. They wrenched the pitchfork out of the fallen man and pointed it at the big man. Blood dripped from the tines. You, you killed, killed my grandpa, she gasped. He nodded. I guess that's how it's got to be then. He pulled the trigger. The bullet passed through the space where Faye had just been as she materialized off to the man's side. She gasped in pain. She'd gone too fast, hadn't used her instincts, and done something wrong. But there was no time, and she stabbed the pitchfork deep. 
The man looked down at the iron embedded in his body. The top was in his ribs, the middle had to be through his guts, and the bottom went in just under his belt. Faye drove her weight forward, trying to stick it in deeper, but the man calmly grasped the shaft and wouldn't let her. It was like pushing on a wall. The man hauled the fork out of his body, several inches of bloody metal from each spot, and in the process knocked Faye on her butt. Grandpa's leather bag hit the ground, spilling something metallic into the hay. Blood leaked out the three holes in the one-eyed man's side, but he didn't seem to care. His attention focused in on the bag. Faye scrambled for it. Fingers hitting the drawstrings just as he pointed the big revolver at her and desperate. She traveled further than she ever had before. That was part eight of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, as read by Bronson Pincho. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. And thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a 500 cannon salute from an armada of dirigible warships on course to retake Antarctica from the Martians and their lanky tripods. To longtime and much beloved fame cover artist Tom Kidd. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Bye.